Good morning, everyone. Great to see you in the room and great to see you at home as well. Um, it's so good to be with you all. Um, and yeah, I'm just delighted to actually be here. I haven't been here a lot lately, so it's really nice to physically be in the room with so many faces I haven't seen for a while. So um, Dave and Emeka talked a little bit about Tri Church Sunday. That's coming up next Sunday. And I just want to say this is just the most easiest opportunity to invite people along to church and we just um, you've got some cards hopefully that you can hand out if you forgot to grab some when you were doing when they went past there's more available at the back but we're going to show you a very short video of Tim who invited a whole bunch of people this last week or so so have a listen to this and see if that inspires you and makes Tim go red hi it's Tim here I've just invited the chief executive and five directors from my organisation to try Church Sunday, which is on Sunday the 31st of October. Now, we don't really do religion in my organisation, so if I lose my job by Monday, I'm going to blame Andy Chapman because he told <laughs> us to do this. That's, that's probably not going to happen, right? But what might happen is these people might come along to church they might meet with Jesus, it might change their lives. I'm glad I've invited them and I'm really keen to see what God might do. That's good, right? Sometimes it just takes a, a little bit of bravery, doesn't it? And, you know, as those um, old Dr. Pepper adverts used to say, what, what's the worst that could happen? Um, let's... <laughs> Tim might lose his job, but it'll all be okay in the end. I want to start with this. Is anyone familiar with this image that um, is going to come up behind me? Is anyone familiar with that? Um, so this is Squid Game, okay? Now, before I say what I'm about to say, I haven't watched this TV show. I probably won't, but I'm not about to make a judgment on anyone who has or is planning to watch it, okay? <laughs> you are just going to have to make your own mind up. But this is the highest grossing Netflix show in history. It's, um, it's, I think, speaks a lot of the world that we live in today. So for those who've opted out of Squid Game, and by the sounds of it, you know, I'm not going to, I don't know how many of us has opted out of it at the moment, but I'm going to give you a brief rundown of what you've missed, but I'm not going to give you any spoilers, because I can't give you any spoilers because I haven't watched it but just in case, you know. So this is the premise. There's a group of desperate people. This is in South Korea. They're facing incredible debt, and they're in dire need of money. And they get this invitation um, to play si uh, these six games and to win an awful lot of money if they win it. Does that sound straightforward so far? It sounds like any kind of game show you might have found. What they don't know is that of these 456 players, only one of them is going to go to win, and everyone else is going to be killed. Now, for anyone concerned, this is not reality TV, okay? But I think it highlights some of the very real brokenness that we see in the world around us today. You know, we look at the impact of COVID, and it's not going away anywhere quickly right now, is it? It continues to impact our world, impacts our health, our finances, employment, our ability to travel. It, it impacts our relationships. The effects of isolation and loneliness, as many of us have been forced to spend less time with others, has had really deep and profound effects on our health, our mental health, our emotional and spiritual well-being. And to top that all off, you've got prices for things like gas just going through the roof. And so there's so much uncertainty right now. Maybe this is where you find yourself today. Maybe you're worried about how you're actually going to get through this next winter. Regardless of whether you're actually experiencing that kind of worry, that is the part of the, that's the society that we're all part of. So many of us just worried and panicking about how we're going to get through the next few months. What a depressing way to start. But I believe there is good news for each one of us this morning, whether you know Jesus or whether you don't, because we have a God that we can put our hope in. 
We have a God who provides, a God who is passionate about the broken and the hurting, the last and the lost and the least, as we sung about earlier. And despite all of this turmoil around us, our hope is in a God who never changes, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as a church, we follow his lead. We are going to remember and we are going to serve the poor and the broken and the needy around us. So this morning, what we're going to do, we're going to continue our series on Reset. If you've missed any of this series, I really encourage you, go and have a look on our talks page on our website. You can catch up on all the talks there or on our YouTube page. Been really, really helpful. This morning, I'm going to share a little bit about how we can rebuild with this mandate of serving the poor at the forefront of everything that we do. So I'm going to share a little bit about God's heart for the poor, talk a little bit about how Nehemiah, the book that we're going through, how he dealt with this kind of situation. And also, I'm going to let you know more about how you can be part of this as I share some exciting news a little bit later, but more of that in a bit. If you don't know Jesus yet, I, you're so, so welcome. and I'm so glad you're here, and I hope some of what I share is helpful. If you've been following Jesus for decades, you're equally welcome, and I hope what we share today is going to help you as well. So I'm going to read from Nehemiah this morning, chapter 5. Before I do that, I'd love to pray for us. So, Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the Bible. I thank you there are things that were written thousands of years ago that still speak to our situation today. And I pray that the words that we unpack today would come alive in our hearts and not only impact us, but impact the community and the world around us. We pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we're going to read. So why don't you grab your Bibles, grab your phone. It will come up behind me, but it's really great to be able to follow along yourself as well. Just check what I'm saying is the good stuff. So we're going to read from verse 1 of chapter 5 of Nehemiah. Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their Jewish brothers. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous in order, are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still, others were saying we have had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we are of the same flesh and blood as our countrymen and through our sons are as good as, as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. When I, that's Nehemiah, heard the outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you are exacting usury um, from your own countrymen. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have brought back our Jewish brothers who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you are selling your brothers only for them to be sold back to us. They kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. That's always, an, you know, you always know someone's guilty when they find nothing to say, don't you? So I continued, what, are you, what you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain. But let the exacting of usury stop. Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses, and also the usury you are charging them, the hundredth part of the, mo of the money, grain, new wine, and oil. We will give it back, they said, and we will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. Then I summoned the priests and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they had promised. We're going to pause there. There's a lot, lot already in there, isn't there? Let me just recap where the story is right now, just for those that are catching up, but just to kind of get us up to speed. 
You know, Nehemiah finds himself in quite the scenario, doesn't he? I'm not sure he quite knew what he was doing, whether it would lead to this kind of situation when he left a really safe place. He was serving the king um, back in Persia. He had a really good job. But he goes back. He sees the brokenness in his community in it, back in Jerusalem. He calls the people of Jerusalem and Israel together to come and rebuild the city. And so people come from miles around to rebuild different parts of that city wall. And where we find it today is a lot of these, these guys have left their homes, their farms. Um, they've left behind families, behind to fend for and to feed themselves. And if that wasn't bad enough, there's a famine here as well. And the greedy were stockpiling what they could in order to make profit. And I don't think we're talking toilet paper, hand sanitizer, or unleaded fuel here. Families and whole communities found themselves in desperate need. We read in verse 2, we need grain. Verse 4, they had to borrow money to even pay taxes. And no money and no grain meant no food on the table. So as a, as a result of these, these circumstances they found themselves in, as well as personal greed, a whole community had been impacted. Does any of this sound familiar? But you know, it gets worse. Many families were so desperate that they even resorted to putting their children into slavery. Can you imagine? I'm a parent myself. I cannot imagine what they must have gone through in order to need to do that. The only way that they could feasibly know that they could feed their children was by selling them to somebody else. My mind just can't get around that. It's heartbreaking. And so as Nehemiah hears these stories, his heart breaks. He says, I am angry. And as the leader of these people, they look to him to make things right. So this morning, what I'm going to do, I'm going to share three things that we can learn from Nehemiah's response as we look to serve the poor in our own communities. And then I'm going to share some practical ways we can all get involved in our communities, particularly as we get closer to Christmas. I don't want to I'm not going to tell you how many days or anything like that. I'm not going to scare you, but that's what we're going to do this morning. So we read in verse 1, Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their, against their fellow Jews. And then we jump forward a few verses to verse 6, and Nehemiah says, When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. The first thing that we see here is that Nehemiah listens he listens to the cries of the people. And in this, I think there are echoes of, of Exodus chapter 3, where God hears the cries of his own people whilst they are in slavery in Egypt. You see, our God is a God who gets close to the suffering. He hears the weeping. He hears the cries. And the Bible shows us, you go right from back to the beginning, that God has a special place in his heart for the poor. Now, if you count up all the times that poverty or the poor are mentioned directly or indirectly in the Bible, it's more than 2,000 times. It's a big deal. I'm so challenged by what John Wimber, he's the founding pastor of the Vineyard Movement. He once said that if we don't remember the door, then don't put Vineyard on the door. If we don't remember the poor, don't put Vineyard on the door. That makes more sense. It's like this is, this is part of God's story but it's also part of our story. Caring for the poor is part of God's heart, and it's part of who we are. It's why Storehouse, our food bank, has been running since 1994, not as a response to COVID or any other crisis, but because the church should always be remembering the poor. But there's a personal challenge here too. You see, in order to listen to someone, you've got to be close enough to hear. And God wants us to be close enough to hear the cries of suffering. So I want to ask you this question today, and I ask myself as much as anybody else. Are we close enough to hear the cries of the poor? And I think the question that he's asking us today is, will you take the time to listen? It's really hard right now, isn't it? 
I know I'm finding this incredibly hard, partly because I've been stuck at home a lot of the time, but many of us simply don't go out as much as we used to. Many of us are so affected by our own issues that we struggle to hear the cries of others. Honestly, I can't remember the last time I walked past someone who was asking for food or asking for money or sat down and really listened to someone's story. The reality is that many of us around, around us are struggling to feed their families. Perhaps that's you today. Maybe you're worried about how you're going to get through these next few months. Maybe you even feel a certain amount of shame owning up to this, even to yourself. I want to say to you this morning that you are loved, and it's okay. It's okay. So if you need help this morning, come and talk to one of us. Come and talk to someone you've seen on stage, the pastoral team, a small group leader, storehouse team are here, someone you trust, and we will help. If you're struggling for work, struggling to put food on your table, we have a wonderful storehouse team, and we can help provide food for you. If you're struggling to find work or struggling with your finances, we're going to be launching a job club and a money advice center in, in, early in the new year, giving practical skills to those of us who need it. And this is just as much for those in the church as it is for those in our community. I'm really excited to tell you about some of the things that are going to be coming up. We're going to leave that a few weeks, but it's really exciting what the Lord is stirring in us as we respond to the needs of those around us, including ourselves. So I want to encourage us all to take time to listen to those around us. So maybe it's going out when you see your neighbor putting the bins out. It's taking those opportunities to have conversations. Maybe there's someone in your small group that you just need to give a bit more time to. The, the reality is, I think for many of us, poverty has become sanitized. You know, I don't know if you remember those images of families of attempting back in lockdown to visit elderly relatives in care homes. This is at the height of the pandemic. Maybe you experienced that from one side or the other. You couldn't go inside, so all you could do was look through the glass. Those images were heartbreaking. And I think this is how a lot of us see poverty. We see everything through a screen. Has anyone been on a Zoom call in the last 18 months? I'm pretty sure most of us have done that. Now, as amazing as technology is, how much harder is it to actually connect with that person? Especially when the screen starts freezing and, you know, all of that. And, you know, you realize you've been talking away and internet's gone and you're talking to no one. It's a nightmare. But when we look at poverty through a screen, how can we expect to be touched by the pain? How can we expect to actually enter into the story of those who are suffering? Have we become numb to the cries of the poor? I believe the Lord wants us to hear those cries again to connect with his heart. He wants our hearts to be broken for the poor, the broken, and the needy in our communities. It all starts then when we hear the cry, but it must lead us to act. Nehemiah heard the cries of the suffering, and, and we read in verse 6 that he got angry. He got really angry, and he confronted those who were exploiting those who are in need. You know, whether we own up to it or not, so many of our actions flow from our emotions, don't they? And if you're thinking, no, nah, I'm not really an emotional type, think about how you felt when you were last caught up at the roundabout when you were driving, or when a parking fine landed on your, uh, on your doorstep, or when your child had a bad day at school and then the email that you wanted to send. You know, it's okay to be angry, but what's important is how we respond to that anger. So take the removal of the, the uplift for universal credit. Now, I wish we lived in a world where there was no need for universal credit. But we live in a broken world. People will go hungry. Children will suffer as a result of that change. 
Families are already struggling, particularly as a result of this horrible pandemic, which is still affecting so many around us, increasingly so. And so the struggles continue around us. And this isn't a political statement, but that makes me angry when that's taken away. When we see any type of injustice in our world, when we see families struggling to make ends meet. So what can we do to serve the poor? Our listening's got to lead to action. It's got to change how we live our lives, how we fill our time, how we spend our money. But where, where can we start? I love this from Arthur Ashe. He was the legendary tennis player back in, I think, the 70s, mostly before I was born. Just, he said this. He said, start where you are. Use what you have. Do what you can. I'm going to repeat that because I think it's really good. Start where you are. Use what you have and do what you can. In other words, none of us are ruled out, yeah? That's all of us. We can all start from that place. So what is broken in the world around you? You may see homelessness every day. Maybe that's the place to start. Maybe there's some way that you can respond. Perhaps someone in your small group is going through a hard time. Maybe one of your neighbors. Could you make them a meal? Could you look after their kids for a bit? You may see all sorts of issues in your street, in your town center, and maybe that's the place to start. I want to also tell you about some of the ways that you can get involved here at Riverside as well. There's a whole bunch of things that we do in terms of compassion. So I'm going to talk to you briefly about Storehouse. The Storehouse is awesome. And, and the team there are just incredible at serving the needs of those around us. But we're always looking for people to help, sort of behind the scenes, so whether you can sort some food or clothes, but also in serving clients at the front as well. And a specific ask this week. We're always wanting to do more, and a really practical way that you can help this week is by helping us to reset the garage area. So we have some amazing space, but we want to be able to use it really well. So if you think that you could come in this week, there's some dates up there, something's the, I haven't got it written down here, the 27th and the 28th. Could you come in and help us on those days? If you think you could do that, there's going to be a team at the back. So Karen's here. Karen, give us a wave. Karen's in the building. So you can chat to the guys today, or you can email storehouse at riversidevineyard.com, and that will help us to be able to serve more people. That would be amazing. Now, the second thing I want to tell you about this, and this is where it gets exciting, because I'm not going to tell you how many days to Christmas, like I said earlier, because I know that just puts the panic on, and I, I'm not, I, you know, I haven't done any shopping yet or anything like that, but it's getting closer. That's all I'm going to say. But we want to tell you about Love Christmas today. There should be some flyers on your seats if you're in the room. Um, otherwise, you can always go to riversidevineyard.com slash lovechristmas. And all the details are in there. You can sign up as well. But I'm going to talk through this, this little flyer now. So there are four ways that you can get involved this year. Um, but... Basically, just to kind of, just to set the scene, you know, Christmas is such a great time to be able to show God's love to the world around us in really practical ways. Um, and so this is something that we do every year in different ways. Um, and there are four particular ways that you can get involved this year. The first thing is through Storehouse Christmas. So we are going to be giving out toys. We're going to be giving out hampers to our family. So we want to make sure that everyone gets a toy for their kid to open on Christmas morning. Sometimes it's the only one they get to open. And, and then we, um, we want to give out a hamper of luxury items as well. And I'll come to those in a bit. Um, and there are particular ways that you can get involved with this. The first thing is by giving your time. So we are going to be um, running these events on Thursday the 9th and Saturday the 11th. And we need a bunch of team to help us to give away these items. Now, every, some, pre-COVID, we used to run a big party, you know, donkeys and all that kind of thing. We don't think that's quite going to be possible. But 
We want to do the absolute best that we can. So there is the hope that we can run. Um, Dave and Beth are going to hopefully be able to run some entertainment, do some amazing stuff for our families that we're going to be able to run on the Saturday. So we're really hoping we can do that. But right now, we can't promise we're going to do that. We need to see where the COVID rates are. But at the very least, we are going to make sure that every child has a toy to open and every um, family and every group of people there have some really lovely food to open at Christmas. So that's the first way. The second thing is give a toy. So we want every child to have a toy to open. Um, you can give financially, or you can look at the gift list, which is coming. It's not quite there yet on the Love Christmas page on the website. For, for some, we know that this will be the only gift they open on Christmas morning. Second thing, you can give a hamper. We would love every family to have some really nice stuff. So we're talking luxury, Tesco finest here. You may not normally eat Tesco finest, but we want to do the best for our clients. We last year gave out 130 hampers, costing around 30 pounds for each one. We would love to get to 150 this year. Does that sound good? We could get to 150 hampers. So maybe you can do that on your own or maybe with your small group. Um, and then we can also give financially. So if you're not able to make it in or you would rather give financially, you can do that to bless our storehouse families this Christmas. So in terms of finance, you know, maybe think about whether you could, you know, maybe you could tithe what you would normally spend at Christmas. So if you spend 800 pounds, which is like the average spend at Christmas, could you give 80 pounds? If you, 100 pounds, could you give 10 pounds? That would be incredibly helpful. Or could you sponsor a whole family? So a family of four, it would be 60 pounds. 30 pounds for the hamper, 15 pounds for children, for each of them to get a gift. Or a family of five would be 75. Does that sound good? It's a really great way to get involved. Secondly, we've got wrapping parties. We've got three lined up. You can see the details behind me. You can come along with your, on your own, with your household, with your small group, make an evening of it. We'll wrap the toys, we'll pack the hampers, we'll sign some cards and just bless our families with love. You can do that, you can sign up online only today, but there'll be sheets over the next few weeks. Third way, bags of kindness. I'm so excited about this. This is new for us this year. What we want to invite everybody to do is to grab a bag, okay? We're gonna provide the bags for you. You need to throw, fill it with kindness, and by kindness, I think we're probably talking chocolate here, yeah? Kindness equals chocolate. I could be an advertising, you know, marketing guy with that. But, um, and then we want to give them a postcard inviting them to be part of our Christmas service. So then could you go and bless your community? Could you give them to your neighbors, to your colleagues, to your teacher? Maybe you know a healthcare professional. Go and spread some blessing around. Spread, spread some kindness into our community. You can grab as many as you need. We're going to make sure those are available by the, by the middle of November, we're hoping. Um, and can you just see the multiplying effect of that? That's going to be amazing. And finally, Christmas lunch. We don't want anyone to be on their own this Christmas, but we want to at the very least make sure that everyone has some Christmas lunch to eat. If you could be part of the team delivering food, that would be amazing. You can sign up for that today as well. So really a lot of incredible ways. I've just shared a whole lot of information. Have a look at the sheet. Go back. Have a look at the website. Just prayerfully consider how you can get involved in blessing those around us this Christmas. You can grab a pen, you can do that now, or jump online if you want to, I'll trust you, and then you can pop it in the, in the box at the back there today. Now, before we pray for one another, I just want to share one more thing. In verse 15, we're going to jump back to the text here. We didn't read this earlier, but it says, but the earlier governors, those preceding me, that again is Nehemiah, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. Sounds pretty corrupt to me. Their assistants also lauded it over the people. But out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. You see, as we act, we begin to change. And I think often we think about it the other way around. You see, change doesn't happen when we sit still in ourselves. Change comes when we take a step. 
John Wimber put it like this. He said, we need the poor as much as they need us. You know, I love that we get to be a part of this, to be part of God's big story. But often we miss the fact that the person that needs the most help is us. You see, as we spend time with the poor, the broken, the needy, something changes in us. And we begin to take on more of the likeness of Jesus. Jesus himself said that um, in Matthew 25, we can read it, that when we feed the hungry, when we clothe the poor, when we give the stranger a drink, when we show hospitality, we are actually doing this for Jesus. And when we do this, we become less concerned with our own needs. And we begin to see that the world does not center around us. Sorry if that comes as a shock. And this is where we're going to find Jesus, amongst the poor, the broken, and the needy.